Hi, I'm Steve Selling, founder of Fit Test, and in this series of Laws of the Heart as applicable for exercise professionals, this the topic of this short video is on the Fit Law, both for the whole body and for the heart itself. So the Fit Laws. I'm sorry about using some formula, but we really can't avoid it at this stage. So whole body oxygen demand or the consumption is equal to the cardiac output, the amount of blood flowing through the whole body times the oxygen extraction over the whole body, which is represented by the difference in concentration in oxygen from the when the blood arrives at the oxygen utilizing tissues, which is the arterial oxygen uh, uh, concentration minus the oxygen concentration in mixed venous blood. And the difference between those represents the extraction of oxygen across the oxygen consuming tissues. And when you multiply that by cardiac output, you get whole, blood, whole body oxygen uh, consumption. Now just a note on oxygen concentration in the mixed venous blood. There are only two structures in the body where mixed venous blood can be found. Uh, that is the right ventricle and the pulmonary arteries. Now it is not in the right atrium as, as people would often think because the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava may have different oxygen contents in them depending on the metabolism and the activity of the person at that time. And thereby if you sample from the right atrium, then that may not be representative of true mixed venous oxygen con uh, concentration. By the time it gets into the right ventricle, that blood is thoroughly mixed and of course it doesn't change going across the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary arteries. Now the equivalent for the heart itself is really important to our understanding and being able to work with uh, cardiac uh, clients. And that is really just the equivalent of a cardiac output is now coronary artery blood flow. We still have oxygen in the artery because remember the coronary arteries originate from the aorta. In other words, they have the same content of oxygen as does the aorta in the coronary arteries. However, the vein, the venous system in the heart is represented by oxygen concentration in the coronary sinus, which is equivalent to mixed venous blood for the whole body. So that's the formula for the heart. And just finally, before I leave uh, formula, um, arterial oxygen concentration is obviously very important in uh, this uh, figure, in this um, scenario. And that's equivalent to a tiny percentage, 0.003 of the freely dissolved oxygen, which is PaO2, plus 1.4 times the hemoglobin concentration times O2 saturation. Now because um, the one, of the 1.4 versus the 0 0.003, we can almost ignore or largely ignore the freely dissolved oxygen. And really the arterial oxygen concentration is really a measure of how much hemoglobin we have in the, in the blood multiplied by the O2 saturation at any one time. Uh, each hemoglobin molecule being able to bind four uh, oxygen molecules. Now, just before I leave this slide, I want to say one other thing about coronary sinus O2 levels. This is usually very low compared to normal venous blood. Uh, so the heart extracts a lot of oxygen as it goes across the um, coronary circulation. And by the time it gets into the venous system of the heart itself, it's very low. Now, if this is very low, it means that this part of the formula really dominates. In other words, coronary artery blood flow and O2 arterial are the dominant factors to supply oxygen uh, to the heart muscle. Now, we would know that from coronary artery disease because in coronary artery disease, the major goal of treatment is to try and um, restore or protect coronary artery blood flow. And of course, if the person has comorbid lung diseases where O2 arterial is, is impinged or impaired, and also if the person had anemias, in other words, low hemoglobin, then this would also interfere with the oxygen supply to the heart muscle. So anyone with anemias who also has coronary artery disease should be aggressively treated for those anemias as they should also be treated 
uh, very um, effectively for any lung diseases as well. So I don't want to go over this slide at all because I've created a whole other video on, on this topic here. It's really just to look at um, the two major measures of haemoglobin here for different uh, conditions and also O2 sats over here for those, for those conditions. So I'm not going to talk about that here because you can find that other video on the utility of O2 saturation in my video series. So just to come to <clears throat> how the FIC law works, we've just looked at this formula <clears throat> for the whole body. And so in heart failure, coming now to the clinical situation, cardiac output is impaired or reduced. And so if cardiac output is impaired, how do we supply whole body oxygen if this is already impaired? Well, what we have to do is we have to increase this. We have to increase O2 AV difference. Now we can't, um, this is already, um, this is low due to the disease. We can't do anything about O2 arterial because this is in a healthy, uh, healthy lungs and people who don't have anemia. Uh, this is going to be nearly um, max, maximal. And so we can only really deal with this, which is re um, referring to the tissue extraction of oxygen across the oxygen utilizing tissues. And this is the one which should decrease. So we need a decrease in the O2 venous blood, in other words, greater oxygen extraction for a lower cardiac output in order to supply sufficient oxygen uh, to, uh, supply to the whole body. And this compensates for low cardiac output. In the heart itself, um, we can use the formula here for FIC to understand why O2 arterial uh, must not be low, such as in many of the lung diseases and also in anemia, because of this relationship of haemoglobin and O2 sats uh, dominating O2 arterial concentration. These have to be corrected, um, treated aggressively in, for example, heart failure, where where blood flow is low and coronary artery disease. Now, just on heart failure, remember the cardiac output is low in heart failure. And remember that uh, coronary artery blow, blood flow depends at least partly on, on um, cardiac output because the coronaries originate from the uh, top of, or just from the beginning of the aortic arch, just above the aortic valve. So if coronary artery blood flow um, depends somewhat on cardiac output, then all of these things need to be corrected also, not just in coronary artery disease that is obvious, but also in heart failure. So um, just moving on to another formula, blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. You probably have seen this in your undergraduate studies. Therefore, cardiac output equals blood pressure divided by total peripheral resistance. And if we break um, uh, cardiac output down into heart rate times stroke volume uh, divided by uh, TPR, then uh, we, we see how that works. Cardiac output is a relatively fixed requirement. So if increased resistance, there's an increase in blood pressure. In heart failure, there's a, a, a fall in cardiac output and so other mechanisms need to compensate such as increased oxygen extraction in the tissues and I just covered that. The goal of heart failure medications are not to restore cardiac output. That is not normally the goal for heart failure medications because that will progress heart failure at a greater clinical progression rate. But a goal of treatment in the case of, say, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors such as perindopril, any, any any uh, generic drug ending in PRIL, P-R-I-L. This is to uh, slow down cardiac remodeling and oppose inappropriate increases in left ventricular and diastolic volume. And I've, I've spoken a lot about this topic in the one of the other um, topics in this series on laws of the heart, on the um, Frank Starling law of the heart, in other words, preload. So you can go to that other video to get more information on this. Decreased work of the, low, of the heart for a given low cardiac output. Uh, beta blockers and diuretics uh, do, do this. Diuretics by, again, opposing increases in left ventricular and diastolic volume. 
in other words, pushing people to the left on the Frank Starling law of the heart and keeping people safe in terms of uh, left ventricular end diastolic volume not being too high. And beta blockade, of course, reduces the work of the heart by decreasing both heart rate and uh, the pumping action of the heart in the form of stroke volume. Uh, sometimes when palliation is needed, the, the heart failure, a different class of medications, the inotropes may be applied to increase the work of the heart in the situation where someone has decompensated heart failure. In ischemic heart disease, clearly we're trying to slow the progression of ischemic heart disease by dealing with hypercholesterolemia. And sometimes uh, coronary artery vasodilatation must be treated and they're the anti-anginals. So just coming uh, uh, to my last slide here, VO2 is an absolutely fixed requirement. In other words, if you need 250 mils of oxygen per minute, then that's what you need. And you don't do well if only 200 is supplied. So given that O2 arterial for most healthy or healthy lungs without anemia is a fixed and, and at a fairly maximal level, then all we can do is, and, and, OC, and O2 coronary sinus is already very low, this means that essentially VO2 cardiac depends very much on coronary blood flow. But if heart rate is high, coronary blood flow will be reduced due to the so-called tourniquet effect. Now, what happens here is the, um, when the heart is uh, pumping um, during systole, the heart muscle squeezes down on the small coronary vessels and chokes off blood flow into those coronary vessels during the contractile phase of uh, the heart cardiac cycle. And this is called the tourniquet effect. So if the heart is spending too much time in systole and not enough time in diastole, this will decrease coronary artery blood flow and make it um, quite um, a problem for people who already have coronary artery disease. So one of the therapeutic goals of beta blockade is to reduce heart rate so that the heart can spend more time in diastole per minute and less time in systole, which will help coronary artery blood flow. Coronary artery blood flow is greatest during um, diastole and, uh, and, and reduces down to very little during systole. So thank you for looking at this uh, video on the FIC law of the heart and the FIC uh, law for the whole body. Uh, you can get back to me on info at myfittest.com.au. Bye for now.